The definition of perception is a belief or opinion formed based on how something seems to be. Your perception can be changed. However, sometimes to do that, you need your perceptions to be challenged. I'm a mom, I'm a business owner, I'm a student, and I volunteer. And I am here on this very famous stage. And I'm guessing your perception of me will change a few times during the next minutes. Personal appearance is both very self-chosen and environmentally affected. How you feel about yourself, your life experiences, your culture, and your gender all affects how people perceive you. When I was 15, I looked like I was 10. I'm 38 now, and sometimes I still get carded when I'm buying wine. It's fine. <laughs> when most turned their moms for comfort, my mom would spit in my face and tell me I was ugly while I was crying after she had beaten me. I was a scared and insecure child, and I tried to become invisible, because you can't punish what you can't see. I did it by restricting my food intake and by slouching my back, trying to become as small as possible. And I think I was very successful. My friends started calling me Mosquito because of my skinny arms and legs. I was a very innocent looking child, scared and insecure. So it came as an utter shock to everyone when I turned 12 and started smoking. And then again at 13 when I got my first tattoo and started sneaking out of my bedroom window. I st started sneaking out every Friday and Saturday, but quickly realized that that would cause me to get two beatings that weekend. And I'm an intellectual, after all. So I started sneaking out on Fridays and coming back home on Sundays. Now the consequences were going to be the same for me, whether I did or I didn't, and I would rather get punished for something I did than for just existing. I lost my virginity when I was 13. I got raped the first time when I was 14. The way that I looked and felt about myself made me an easy target. I spent the night of my 14th birthday with a 42-year-old man. I realized then that none of my sexual encounters up until then had been with boys, but with men. And I used these parties and these men for safe spaces. And they used my teenage body for pleasure. And that was a fair trade for me at the time. When I turned 15 and my friends started thinking about what education to pursue, I researched what education our tiny town didn't offer so that I could move out and live alone. And I did move out very fast realized it's super expensive to be alive. I didn't have any financial support from my parents, so I had to find work. Not an easy task when you are a child living in a new city. But I found work, I found several jobs, all of them with poor salaries and even worse hours. And I quit school to support myself financially. But, and I was living hand to mouth, but I was finding safety. But after a lifetime of living in high tension, with stress hormones constantly pumping through my body, safety felt like boredom to me. And one night I saw a poster for safaris in South Africa. And I called a friend and asked if we should go. And we were in the same situation. Neither had money, neither had impulse control. So naturally, we booked tickets. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was perceived as being young and reckless when I did that. But if I hadn't done it, maybe everything would have been different. I was given a chance to grow while sharing time and stories around bonfires on beaches. You can still hear Wonderwall playing. <laughs> I learned about friendship, about history and apartheid, 
and the fact that I still had privilege over many others. And in Cape Town, I met a woman that gave me some occupational advice. And I took her advice and I ran with it when I got home. And I became a stripper. And again, I was perceived as naive, stupid, and I was perceived as taking the easy way out. But it was never easy for me. I had to reinvent myself very much with a fake it till you make it attitude. I went from invisible stripper, invisible teenager, to stripper. And by doing that, I met some of the strongest, most independent women I've ever met. And through the friendship they offered, I got community and a sense of belonging. I got self-respect and I started to set boundaries and standards for myself and for those around me. And I've got the freedom to work when and where I wanted. I got financially free and I started believing in myself. As a stripper, you make uh, money on commission from drinks and lap dances. And so I learned about customer relations, sales, marketing, human nature. And eventually, a few years too late, I learned about accounting and taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, by the time I learned that, I owed so much in taxes that I tried calling and asked if I could maybe just go to jail instead of paying. <laughs> if you're wondering, you most likely can't. <laughs> so the stress of all of that made, turned me into a bitter stripper. And I quit making money. And anyway, retirement age was approaching fast. I was nearly 28 after all. So I quit. And I was broke. And I ended up not having a place to live. And every time I applied for work, I could tell I was perceived only as the stripper. So I had to reinvent myself again. And I used my last 10,000, that's about $1,000, and I started through an impulse studio. I lived in a trailer outside of the venue. I was lucky enough to get to use for free. And I bought poles and posters that I plastered all over town. And through the Impulse Studio was a success. It's been nearly, no, it's been more than 10 years now, and we are still steadily growing. I thought by then that maybe I've had my share of challenges, but my biggest challenge was yet to come. When I was 10 or 11, I asked my mom if her mom ever beat her, and she said yes. And I asked, if, is that the reason you beat me? And she said, yes. And that was the moment I decided I would never have kids. But then I met Thomas, and he was strong and robust and kind. And he made me believe that maybe I could be a mom. And I started getting a clear view of the kind of mom I wanted to be, strong and compassionate and loving. Now, my son turned out to be one of the most strong-willed kids I've ever met. And not only that, he showed signs of enjoying being in opposition from the moment he could crawl. He would laugh out loud while doing the exact opposite of what we told him, and he just enjoyed it so much. <laughs> but if we physically stopped him, he would have tantrums that made my brain shut down, my vision narrow, my mouth dried out, heart was pounding, and it could last for up to hours at a time. It was mayhem in our house several times a day. And I didn't have time or energy for friends or family anymore, and my community became my boyfriend and my son. Money got tighter. My son broke something every day, clothes, furniture, plates and cups, even mattresses. And then we got an explanation. My son is autistic. And the more I learned, the more I felt like a failure, and my heart broke. 
because my son, I hadn't understood my son at all. I had tried to fit him into a frame that I had created, but my son had completely different need, needs. My normal was so stressful, I developed night sweats, insomnia, depression. I was constantly high on stress and survival hormones, and my body and mind was exhausted. I was sick all the time, and I was, I was not winning. And that feeling was reinforced by the way people looked at us. When I had to carry my son out of the grocery store, kicking and screaming and punching me in the face, I saw how I was perceived. I was perceived as a mom that didn't teach my son how to behave. Some looked at us with compassion, but I could feel the judgment streaming out of others. Now, my son is not mostly nonverbal. So I took it upon myself to be his voice, to make him be understood. I might not always do that right either, but I am and I will keep doing my best. And this is a letter that I wrote on his behalf a year ago to help him be understood. My name is Marcus. I'm three and a half. I don't speak very much. And when I do, few understands me. I appreciate the kid who always says, hi, Marcus, even though I never answer. Maybe it's your child that always tries to play with me, even though I'm not completely sure how to participate or show that I enjoy the company. I'm autistic, which means I see the world dif differently. I don't know the social codes that come naturally to most. I don't like making eye contact, and I still don't know it's such an important part of our lives. Sometimes I get furious because my sock keeps sliding on my foot and you can't see it and I don't know how to tell you, but to me it's the only thing in the world. Every minute, every second, I can feel it. It's all consuming and I can't think of anything else. And all sounds, lights and feelings multiplies and I feel helpless. I'm not being bad, I'm not trying to get attention. I can't think or feel anything but the sock that's sliding down my foot. And I can't tell you, and you keep trying to make me look at you, and the sounds get louder, and the lights get brighter, and I'm scared, and I feel frustrated, and angry, and alone. I'm not being bad or disobedient. I'm just having a really hard time. My mom calls me her little weirdo because I love nachos, but I won't eat the ones that has air bubbles. <laughs> I enjoy surprising mom and dad by loving pasta one day and then angrily throwing it on the floor the next. Even though my mom says I'm a real rascal, I don't lay down and cry and yell and hit my head to be bad. It's not because my mom and dad didn't teach me right from wrong. It's because the world sometimes overwhelms me. I hope to find friends that understand and accept that sometimes I have to regulate my emotions and do re repetitive things, such as pouring water from one cup to another. It doesn't mean I'm not listening. I focus better when I can do such things. My name is Marcus. I'm three and a half. I still have a lot to learn. My mom says that being open is the first step towards understanding and inclusiveness. And I say, no matter how many steps we must take, someone should make sure the socks aren't sliding. The thing about perception is that it can change. And a change in perception can be a change in understanding. It can be the stepping stones to perceiving yourself and others more compassionately, no matter what their circumstances have been or are. Your perception about yourself and others can hold you back or give you strength to move forward. Which will you choose? Thank you. <laughs>